What a day. What a day. I learned so much and I met so many new people and that's what's great when you're in education. Can you hear me now? When you're in education, it's about being a connected educator. So if you met four or five new people today, make sure you find out how to connect with them on social media. I'll just follow you around. <laughs> Speak with them on social media, email, share connection before you leave because staying connected will make us all better educators. My, my role today is to help you connect the dots. I want you to leave to connect the dots because it's so hard when you go home and you say, oh, I saw this great new tool and it's just deer and headlights. Or you go to the superintendent and say, I'd like to have an ed camp. Let's have an ed camp this summer. And they're like, well, is that marshmallows, hot dogs? How much will that cost? So it's so hard when you get energized at something like this. There's over 150 people here today. And you go back and someone says, well, that'd be nice, but maybe we could try it in 2018, 2019. So I don't want you to have that kind of down experience. But it's not about the tools or devices. I'm here today to say it's about the questions that we ask. And I'm going to leave you some questions, but I hope that you can help me out. Mark Sanborn is a thought leader. He's not an educator, but he's a leadership author and consultant. And he said, in the past, leaders were those who knew the right answers. Today, leaders are those who know the right questions. So whether you're a teacher leader, a principal, a superintendent, I would ask you, what questions are you going to go back and ask your school district and your coworkers? As I'm presenting today, you'll have the opportunity to type your questions. So those questions will be live on the first screen to my left. If you're not familiar with Padlet, it's a double click, and then you just type your question. If you have 10 questions, that's better because when we leave, we'll have our questions, plus we'll have your questions to take back to our school district. So I ask you at this time to go into Padlet. If you can't see the URL because it's very small, my presentation is in the agenda, so you don't need to take notes because you have access to the whole presentation. I will propose some questions that I've learned in education, but I want you to join me this afternoon. As I speak, I want you to type questions you have in your head, questions you may ask a colleague when you get back, questions you may ask if you're a principal or a teacher leader, you may ask the entire school, because I propose that the questions we ask will help us transform teaching and learning and help our students in the state of North Carolina. Alan November has a very small book, but it's a powerful book titled, Who Owns the Learning? So that one question about two years ago transformed when I walk into a classroom. I no longer look at what the teacher's doing, what the student's doing, what's on the wall. The first thing I ask myself before I open the door and walk in is, who owns the learning? And it doesn't take me very long to figure out what kind of class it is because the things you learn today at the Friday Institute would be the types of things you would hope to see as a teacher or administrator. So who owns the learning is one question I ask. And we see we have a couple questions beginning over there. So keep up with the qu questions from the audience. A second question I like to ask is do our classrooms empower students with the four C's, creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. And a fifth C is contribution. As I sit in a classroom and observe, because in my role I work with K-12 teachers, I wanna see are the students contributing or is it just a tool? I can see collaboration, but that doesn't lead to transfer. I wanna see do the students transfer that to new understandings? Are the students making videos or are they just sitting in class watching videos every day? Everything you learn today can be good if used properly. So I am very much an advocate for technology integration in schools, but I think we need to ask this question. A very powerful question over the past year to me has been, are students contributing or are they consuming? Consumption is sit and get. We've all been in that classroom in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, but con contribution is when you walk in and it looks like it was today. You had this after lunch, you had something going on at every table in this room, something different. And then after that, you had a plurn time. So during that plurn time, that's what we want to see in K through 12 classrooms. And we do see that in several classrooms in North Carolina. But to get that to grow, I think we need to ask ourselves this critical question. 
Are students consuming or contributing? Justin Tart is a blogger I follow, and he's out of St. Louis, Missouri. And Justin asked, what's the ratio of consumption to creation in your classroom? Now that may make somebody offended when you first ask that the more a grade level team, a fourth grade grade level team asks that question, and the more they analyze their work, the closer they're gonna get to blended learning. You don't have to have one-to-one -one technology. Every kindergartner doesn't need an iPad, but you do need to ask, what's the ratio of consumption to creation in our classroom. This is the age-old question. If you're a curriculum specialist or a classroom teacher, this is basic lesson planning, unit planning 101. What do we want students to know and be able to do? And so when you go back, I think if you start with this question, you're not going to say, well, we need this many devices and we need a Sphero and we need a makerspace and in the makerspace we need this, this, and this. You're going to start with a basic question that's over 100 years old and that conversation will lead your staff because I think if you go back with the things you learned today and say we learned this, this, and this, it's overwhelming to someone who didn't come to the Friday Institute. But if you lead with a question, it'll be a rich conversation. Are we focused on the right device or the skills students need? You can look at the Common Core State Standards. You can look at your local goals, your school improvement plan. I think too often we have a school improvement plan and it's a checklist. And we don't stop to ask the question, are we focused on the right skills? The skills we talk about college and career readiness. Everybody in North Carolina wants to graduate a college and career ready who is ready for the world. But what does that look like? So if we talk about the skills, then we can bring in the tools and the devices that we learned about today, and those will be very helpful. I'm going to pause for just a moment and share this little two to three minute video clip. Some of you may have seen this before, but if you have not seen this before, I think this really hits on the question, what questions are we asking? So let me pause for a moment and play the video. The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe, deciding one day they were gonna go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing, and it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas, and then through science and technology, bring them to reality. And that then sets other people on fire, that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero, you know, in thinking big, and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had, that he had, that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon, and here we are. These aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went. No one really knew how to build an airplane, right? No one knew how to fly an airplane. It was amazing and crazy and wonderful, and they wanted to explore. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that. Or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. One of the things that's really critical is not only having the courage to keep trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible. Have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. 
Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things from the very small and personal up to the great, big, and grand. And we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like the really amazing, poetic, and inspirational thing. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling on what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what? I think I can build a space elevator, and let's go and do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people. We stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. When Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon, it's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're going to do it anyway. And that sense chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do? Another question I think we should ask in schools is, is this as good as it gets from the movie? And I think that's funny, but I also think we should ask that. As you build trust with your professional learning team, you will learn to ask questions like this. It's probably not the first question you go back the first week in August and say, is this as good as it gets? But you go all across this state, and we're not where we need to be. And I know there's issues with state legislature. There's issues with our school board or our superintendent. There are always issues. But you have to ask in classrooms, is this as good as it gets? And I ask myself that question today as a leader when I walked around and watched your school districts present. When I saw what you're doing in your school district, I had to ask myself, is my school district doing it as good as we can possibly do it? There used to be little small districts in North Carolina, and those districts were the haves or the have-nots. Now some of the small districts in North Carolina we're presenting today, and I'm, I'm learning from you. We have more money than your district does, but your district's doing it. So I think you have to ask the question, why not us? Whether you're a large district or a small district, why not us? And is this as good as it gets? These are a few resources that have influenced me as a leader, so you'll have access to this in the slides or in your, in your meeting agenda. But these are some great books. I saw some of you had this pulled up today. I was sitting by someone from Alamance Burlington Schools, and they had Ditch That Textbook pulled up on their computer today. The third teacher is about learning space. So if you're looking at transforming learning space, that's one of my favorite books. It's not an education or a group of educators that wrote the book, but that'll push your thinking on learning space in classrooms. Another book that's not really common in education is John Maxwell, Good Leaders Ask Great Questions. In the past year, this has really pushed my thinking as a leader. So a lot of the questions that I ask you, I've developed not from the book because the book doesn't talk about education specifically, but it asked me, what questions are you asking those who you work with? And so I ask you, what questions are you asking? Because the questions you ask may lead to the transformation much faster than if you go back and share 10 tools that you learned today. And we have on the screen questions that you may be asking. Some of you have typed some of those questions. And I'd like to close with a quote from Wiggins and McTie, the late Grant Wiggins. <laughs> Schooling at its best reflects a purposeful arrangement of parts and details organized with deliberate intention for achieving the kinds of learning we seek. So as you recharge and refuel this summer, North Carolina educators, what type of learning do you seek in your schools? Thank you.